Welcome to the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast, a podcast where we teach speakers how to land paid speaking engagements and corporate contracts. Each week, we deliver high quality content that teaches you how to level up your speaking business. Be sure to join the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group after having your mind blown by this information filled episode. Now, here's your host, Ashley Kirkwood, lawyer and professional speaker. This is the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. Hey guys, it's Ashley Kirkwood with the Speak Your Way to Cash podcast. We have with us today Shayna Campbell, who is a growth strategist, and she also owns Her Life by Design, and then she does instructional design as well. So welcome to the podcast. Introduce yourself to the audience. Let us know a little bit about what you do. Absolutely. So first I want to off, I want to say thank you, Ashley, for having me today on the podcast. Uh, Secondly, I want to say that, you know, primarily what I do is I work with corporate organizations to take their underperforming and basically ill-equipped managers and turn them into confident and influential leaders. And part of the way that I do that is by building courses and also facilitating those courses. And then on the growth strategist side, um, it was certainly her life by design. But we found out from my lovely trademark attorney here, Ashley, that I could not trademark that thing. So. It is now called Creative Disrupt Her, which will be trademarked, so don't try it. So So Creative Disrupt Her, where I help um, women design the businesses and lives that they love on purpose. I love that name, Creative Disrupt Her. Okay, I love that. (laughs) All right, awesome. So tell us a little bit about how you started your business and how you've been able to scale that business. We'll start with how you started the business. Absolutely. So um, the business of, of corporate training, we'll just we'll kind of stick with that one. That one started literally as a result of me leaving my dream job. So I was at my dream job. I was developing all of these really um, kind of robust assessment based certificate programs that I, I had an opportunity to work with so many different organizations from your governments to your Hiltons, to your state farms, to everyone. And this is kind of where I would say I cut my teeth in learning like my worth and what this type of environment was like how I could make money in this space. And so then when I left, um, I've been in business full time for three years. And when I left, it was an opportunity for me to, you know, just basically not necessarily go after the same clients, but also kind of build around that of what I knew was already in the market and was needed. And then kind of basically elevate that with the service and, and, you know, serving them in excellence and creating the transformation I knew that they needed for their particular staff. Okay, awesome. And you said a mouthful there. So I want to go back to how did you land your first client for your company on your own? Yeah, absolutely. So my first client, the crazy part is, and I think a lot of people say this, was ATD. (laughs) So it was literally leaving. So you must have been amazing at your job. Hey, you know, it, it was a great experience. Um, but one of the things I, I, I would say is I did a lot of relationship building there. So whenever I, whenever I left, there were some projects that I was working on that they could have definitely given to someone else. Um, but before I actually did decide to leave, I ended up connecting with a few people that I knew I had those relationships with and talked to them about potentially finishing up that project. And so that project, which was a uh, designing a what they call a learn now, which is a two day learning experience, turned into some other work, which turned into some other work. And so it was literally going with the people who knew the work that I did best and then being able to get that referral from them yeah. um, so that I could start going out to other companies. And then from there, it was literally just kind of following on on what I learned there and then reaching out to some of the businesses that were like the businesses I worked with at ATD but not the same businesses. That makes sense. And you mentioned, or we've talked about this a little bit offline, you don't affirmatively pitch. No. Um, Yes, I was talking to Ashley about this because I was saying like, this is the year of me needing to pitch. Like I need to grow in this thing. Um, Mm -hmm. But really it was my relationship building that I had over the years of working at various jobs and literally in talking to friends that work in organizations that may need training. And I would hear something that they were saying. And I was like, hey, maybe if you could put me in touch with this person, I could talk to them about this. And that's kind of how it worked. And then I'd say secondarily um, from the relationship part, I have a referral partner that is dedicated to my success. Like she is a rock star and I love her for it. And so anytime that she has something that she can bring me in on a project that she needs me to consult on, she brings me in and she's kind of one of those people who make sure I get paid my worth. And so I, I'm, I'm thankful for her. 
Okay, so now you got to break that down. A <laughs> referral partner, what does that mean and how did that relationship start? Absolutely. She was actually someone that I worked with at an organization previously. And so she and I had connected. Um, we worked on a several projects together, almost peripherally, like her work directly influenced the work that I did and vice versa. And so in talking to her in the workspace, it was like we built a connection, but it wasn't really exactly that tight. So when I left and we started talking, it became apparent that our work aligns, but it's not competing. And so as my referral partner, what she does or what we do is when we go onto projects or we're looking at projects, I look at things that may be able to bring her work in and she does the same. So when the scope of work does requires training and development or instructional design, she calls me. And when my scope of work includes certification, which is her area of genius, I call her. And so we're just literally dedicated to each other and referring each other with business, whether we work together or it's singularly me doing work that she referred me to. That's very interesting. And now is it exclusive? Like did you all agree that like you will be her go-to and she will be your go-to on those specific areas? Nope. We are friends that have dedicated, we're, we're both just dedicated to, you know, the rising tides, right? Lifts all yeah. the so we, uh, we've never said anything that we are um, exclusive to one another, but the one thing that value that I value about her is that she is always focused on, this is your area of genius. So I know you will do a great job in this. So exactly. I've never even had to say that and, and, and vice versa. I've never had to say like, you're exclusively my certification person because she knows that she's always going to be top of mind whenever because that comes she does a great job. Amazing. <laughs> and that, you know, that is the thing that I love. And, and as I go into this phase of my business, and we've talked about this, like we're, we're in scale mode now. Yep. Okay. This is time to take the top off. As I go into this and I'm pitching things, I am pitching them with certain people in mind who would be great to subcontract with, who can definitely get the job done and who will make you look good. And I think excellence is the standard, regardless of color, creed, or gender, excellence yep. is the standard. And when that's the standard, if you have that person who can do it, then go for it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I love systematizing everything. So I love that you have a referral partner. And I think that it could be something that for the speakers who are listening, you could put a system to that. If you have a complimentary service to another service provider, you could reach out and say, hey, I'd love to have a conversation with you. I get asked this type of thing all the time for the services that you provide. These are the services that I provide. I'd love to chat and see if we could possibly refer each other. Just reach out. And there's nothing wrong if it's ethically OK with your actual career field paying a referral fee, you know, so mm -hmm. you have to look into that. Lawyers, we got all kind of restrictions, <laughs> but <laughs> but for reg if you have a regular consulting business or a regular speaking practice, paying a referral fee, there's nothing wrong with that. You may want to have a provision in your contract that covers it just so your clients know that that happens. But think about that. Cause I interviewed Amber and she talked about that. She mm -hmm. had a real system for reaching out and letting people know what she does, asking them to refer her. And she put a system around it. Yeah. I'm so glad you actually brought that up because I am in that type of referral partnership with a platform, a technology platform. And so they are a learning management system that particularly works with associations. And so what we did was they actually pitched me and so we were online and I, I had uh, connected with someone on LinkedIn and I was like, hey, you know, I'd love to learn more about what you do. Um, and so she was like, yeah, I would love to know what you do. It seems like we're in the same field. Uh, lo and behold, they do training and development. But one of the things that they really do is um, their learning management system. And so she was like, if you have clients that need this and they sign on with us for this learning management system, you get a certain percentage of the phase one contract because technology rollouts usually happen in like three to four phases. And so whatever that phase is, is usually about 85 to 100 grand. And I get a percentage of that particular phase. And I was like, OK, that's a, that sounds great for doing much of nothing, because if they come to me and say I need the service, I don't provide it. But I know somebody who's reputable and who's um, like you said, who can operate in excellence, who can deliver that service. I love that. I love that. And so the learning management system would be for a company that maybe doesn't have a way to display all the training and development that they would like to provide virtually. You would recommend this company to do it. Right. And in the entrepreneur space, that looks like, you know, what you would consider a low kind of base uh, learning management system is like a think ific or a teachable, right? For yeah. entrepreneurs, that's, I think that's our lane. And that's where we know that all that is, is a, a place to house. It's a container for all of your content, your yep. course content. Okay. Awesome. Well, that's good to know. I mean, 
this is the thing about corporate America that I think I did a, a training not too long ago, and it was all about five myths about corporate America. One of the myths is getting into corporate pitching means that I have to have some 15 page proposal, all the connections in the world. You know, it just is going to take a lot. I'm not experienced enough to do it. In your experience, how does that process look? So someone comes to you on LinkedIn or otherwise and says, hey, I was referred to you. We need some training and development in an area that you're an expert in. Send us a proposal. What does that look like for you? Are you sending out proposals? Are you just having conversations and sending contracts? How how has that logistically looked? Because I think that is a mystery for a lot of people and it keeps them out of the game. Yeah, it's a little bit of all of the above. I don't like to send out a contract. It's, it's like in my policy. I don't send contracts without having a conversation. Because what I find is that most organizations, and this is like an entrepreneur can uh, totally agree with this when you're servicing clients as well, is that they say they know what they want and they want this specific thing. And then when you get into that conversation, it's like the blooming onion, right? You're peeling yeah. back all of these layers of the things that they actually need as a result of that. So then when I do my, my actual contract, I, I let them talk, tell me, I ask a lot of questions and I let them tell me what it is that they need or what they yeah. think they need. And then that's how I build my contracts. And because my contracts are value based, meaning that they are flat fee yep. contracts, I can build in all the things that they say they need and all of the things that they say that they want and that they need. And then I can build in the rest of that. I can build in all of the things that I know that they need. And so then I never go to the table with just one contract number. There's always at least two to three options in that contract to give them a breadth of what the conversation was, but then also expose them to some things that they may not have even thought of. Well, okay. So this is, this is something that I want to touch on. You said value-based pricing. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I love that. Okay. And we have to go there because I talked to so many recently, I've been talking to a lot of DNI consultants because we're in right now, in case you all didn't know, newsflash, Diversity and inclusion consultants are in. Black people are so skyrocketing in. in terms of our, well, actually, our value has always been there. People's eyes are opening to the value that is Black brilliance all of a sudden. And, you know, it took them a while, but hey, we cashed the checks. So for folks who are listening who are like, okay, but I charge hourly. And this is where some speakers miss it. They're like, oh, well, I'm going to speak for an hour. It took me an hour to prep. I should charge like an hour. And then I'm going to charge like, 500 an hour because that sounds like a lot so they give me a thousand dollars and that's good explain mm -hmm. why that will never get you to making any money that makes sense <laughs> just explain yes. to the people <laughs> basically when you do it that way you're creating another job for yourself and i think the whole reason why a lot of us are getting into speaking in different streams of income is so that we don't have another job for ourselves come on we and are the value that you're bringing to the table isn't around an hourly rate. Like no. it isn't around, oh, I got paid this much because, you know, Pepsi Cola paid me X, Y, and Z dollar, you know, for me to work there. Well, Pepsi Cola had to make money and they have a framework so that they continue to excel and make money. Now in your business, it is your job to create the framework so that you continue to excel and make money. And so the reason why I do value-based contracts is because there's a few things. It allows you to clarify the scope of work that you're going to do so that you can be clear with the client. Like, this is yep. what I'm going to deliver because this is what you asked for. Exactly. This is exactly what I'm going to deliver. And then I put the clause in there that's very clear. If anything is outside of this scope, we will need to have another conversation yes. about additional compensation. Yes. So um, so while the value base, what the value base does for me is if it doesn't take me 180 hours to complete an instructional design project, then, it, you know, it's fair game for me. Or if it takes me longer, I don't have to keep going back to the client saying, exactly. oh, can you approve this number? Can you do this? Can you do that? So what it comes down to with it gives the client certainty as well. Right. It gives they know them exactly what they're going to pay. Yeah, sorry. It gives them confidence that you know what you're talking about. You can go to the table a little bit more. You can go to the table more confidently, but it also gives them the peace of mind that they won't be nickel and dimed. Yep. 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 And here's another way to think about this. I talk to speakers all the time. And one of the speakers that I was talking to was saying, you know, someone wanted to take a bucket of her time. They wanted to reserve like, let's say five hours a week. Yeah. Okay, great. You can never resell those five hours. So whenever you price based on hours, you are capping your income based on the amount of hours that you're willing to work within a week. 
if you price it based on the value, you're then able to price it based on the people you want to employ. So every contract I get isn't for me to think, okay, well, I can handle all these contracts. No, 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 no. I have to price it so that I can employ the right amount of people to staff the contract. If your contract is worth $500, you ain't staffing nobody. So you will always have to do all the work. And clients expect you to have a team if you're at a certain caliber. Recently, a client was asking me, okay, well, I just want to know. I just want to know. I know you have these people working for you, but how much of this are you going to do and how much is your team going to do? That's technically not the client's business. However, (laughs) however, I was able to assure them, you know, I will be your strategist. So I'm the one you will interface with. Whatever my team handles on the back end is to help me better serve you. Yep. But you can't get there if you're pricing at a level that you can't hire nobody. Right. If you price at a level that keeps you handcuffed to your desk, like you have to be here to answer the phone. You have to be here to answer this email. You have to be here. No, the the goal in your value based pricing is to for you to back out. So this is how you can do it. What results do you provide as as a result of the time that they're asking for that you're going to spend? Yep. Then you do that and then you figure out, Okay, so these are the results that I can provide. And I have provided this because I have proof that I can provide that. Mm -hmm. Then you figure out your price. And I always tell people, if you figure out your price, at least double it, because you're I can automatically tell you, especially if you are a woman and if you are a black woman, definitely double it. Because what we do is we say, oh, we get into this. Oh, well, that's a little bit too much. And I'm not exactly sure. And if they will just double it, let them tell you no. Double it. Yeah. And and not only that, I will never forget. I was I was in an accelerator and there was these the women on the board were predominantly white women and it was a great accelerator. Right. Good. Good. In fact, they're taking applications. So if you're interested, just let me know after this and I'll tell you, I think it's the DePaul Women's Entrepreneurship Institute Accelerator. Look that up. They're taking applications. But I loved it. And one of the women who was in the accelerator, she's on the board. She looked at me after I gave her my I showed all my financials and told her what we're going to do and what I projected to do this year. And it was good. It was, I felt comfortable with it. I was like, this is what we're going to do this year. It's going to be good. We're going to double income. We're going to do this. She was like, why, why isn't your goal to make at least 1.5 million? And I was like, it is, let me erase that. You're right. Let, I just, I just undervalued my whole company. You know what? I'm going to add some zeros to this. Cause she was like, why isn't it that? And I was like, that is a good, why isn't it, you know? And she literally looked at me and was like, there's no way you shouldn't be making seven figures. And I was like, right. you know, I believe you, you must know the Lord. Cause I think he's speaking through you right now. That's true. You know what I mean? That's true. Yeah. And, so, and so, you know, sometimes even with me, like I consider myself to be confident, but there's a certain you're always confident for the level you're at, right? So yes. I was confident for where I was. I left corporate, I was making $300,000. So I'm confident up to like 300000 That's nothing to me. So anything below, below that, I'm like, okay, easy, easy, easy for me to do. But when you start thinking about seven figures, you know, no one's ever paid me seven figures. So my mind was like, I'm doing good. 300000 my business could do this. That's really good. No, 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 no. You can't look around. You got to look up. If you look around you for your motivation... It's not going to work like you're just no. you will stay at a certain level. And so I love being around women like yourself and like the women in that program who were saying like, no, my business did 50 million last year. This is the framework to get your business to 50 million. Let's talk about scalability. And that was what we focused on. It's like, this is your six figure business. What is your seven figure business look like? What is your 50 million dollar business look like? And then what's your escape plan? Because they were like, would you sell? I'm like, I would sell. They were like, great, we got to get your valuation up. I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not tied. (laughs) I would sell. I would sell. sell. That that is absolutely my goal. Like I was in a mastermind and last year actually, and he had us actually go through that process of what do we want our businesses to look like? What does our business look like today? What do we want it to be? And what is your escape plan? And he gave us seven different ways you could potentially escape from your business. Meaning that you could sell and you could still work there if you were that kind of visionary and you mm-hmm. just, you know, or or if you wanted a full exit plan. So we had to visualize all of this. And mine was it was either one of two things. I still wanted to work there as a consultant, like to consult on things or it was literally I'm done. I'm out. Build this, you know, this training and development business to the highest level I could get it or wanted to yep. get it. And thank you. Here you go. 
Give me my money, please. And I'm out. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Ashley Kirkwood here, and I know this is an amazing interview, and if you are someone who is interested in taking your speaking career to the next level, then do I have something for you. Okay, I need you to go to ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash S-Y-W-T-C live replay. That's ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash S-Y-W-T-C live replay. The link is also in the show notes that you can grab the Speak Your Way to Cash live replay, which has seven modules, a ton of information about how you can start speaking your way to cash. Now, this training is absolutely action-packed, phenomenal. It has additional resources. It has templates. It has a podcast pitch template, um, a college pitch template, um, something you can send to media outlets to get on television. It has everything you need to develop a sales strategy, a press strategy, and a plan to skyrocket your speaking career. And it is crazy affordable, okay? So head on over there right now, ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash speak your S-Y-W-T-C live replay and grab your copy today. All right, let's get back to this interview. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just, and we don't, I, I just think you're so spot on about us being women and minorities. Our mindset, we aren't always thinking in the way that we need to think to really get to where we should be getting to. And for me, the money doesn't represent just the money. It represents the freedom that I can have to do what I want to do and to serve my family in the way that I need to serve them. I shouldn't be working these hours forever or for long. Like my daughter is small. So, you know, I hold her on. All, I don't remember. She's seven, eight weeks. I don't remember what my mom did at seven or eight weeks. I know people say like, you know, you want to hold the baby all this time. They really, it really matters. They really look, I don't know what my mom did at seven or eight weeks. I can't tell you, but she never missed any of my events. My dad never missed any of my events. And my dad was an entrepreneur, you know? So like, I know what that looks like when your business can do really, really well. You have freedom, flexibility, and fun with your family. <laughs> if yeah. it's run right and you have a good team. Right. So we, we should, we have to get there. And we already, you know, black women do a lot. We already helping the whole, the, the family, the cousins. We need freedom to do that. Yes. I always say we, we are the epitome of hashtag doing too much. We uh, it does, yes, we are, and then we see problems that aren't ours, and we know we can fix them because we're fabulous, and then we just tinker in the other, you know, we help the people places you ain't got no business being no. or doing, but here you are, <laughs> yes, none at all. So, we have to get to scalability because I already know because we've been talking for an hour before this because I'm actually hiring uh Shana for her services to help me build out a program for corporations. So if you are interested in that, she does do it. So get your money together and then message her after this and I'll post all of her information. But talk about how you were able to scale your business and the average price of your contract. So you all are going to you all are going to love this. <laughs> so when I was leaving from my job and I came into this space, I kept thinking to myself, I don't want to trade just the one off. Like I don't want to trade my time. I don't want to keep chasing that money. So where is the the big money? And I said, well, go back to what you knew. So when I was at my job, I, I was privy, you know, to and privileged enough to have that information about what those contracts look like for us to hire an external subject matter expert to work with me to build a program. And so I was like, oh, OK, so this is what it looks like. OK, so here are the components that goes into that. And then that also helped me be able to price in the value based way because I knew what I could take out and still get them transformation. So then what I started doing was going out to companies and seeing what whatever they needed. And we, we talk about these these contracts and then I would pitch them. And so the average contract, as you say, is 55K or more. And that's an instructional design contract. The facilitation only contracts are lower than that just because you're doing facilitation. But however, I'm currently changing my structure so that even that changes. You will never yeah. you know no longer after August will you be able to buy a one off facilitation opportunity from me at all, unless it's a keynote. Other yep. than that, it has to be packaged in a way where I can create the transformation, but I also can create larger impact within my business. And yep. so 55K or more, and what it does is it allows me to take less contracts to operate in excellence, but then also I was able to hire two individuals part-time to do the work that I needed to do in the instructional design realm so that I could do what I do best, which is this, and also mm -hmm. business development. Yep. Um, so that kind of keeps the trains moving. And I think it's important that we break down instructional design versus 
facilitation because everyone doesn't know. I mean, if you go like I write keynotes, I I write the keynotes that I give, but I'm not designing the it's not instructional design. Like writing a keynote, writing a signature speech is not the same thing as instructional design. And for my business, the reason I called you to actually hire you was because I'm like, okay, well, I need I I want to do more in the design space or I at least want to provide that service. But I'm not a designer. I am a visionary. <laughs> right. I know what needs to be in it, but making it look nice and packaging it well is not my, that's just not where I thrive. And I think it's really important to operate where you thrive. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's key. Yeah. So the, in terms of the instructional design, what you were talking about and how it's different from, I would say, how an entrepreneur understands course development. Yeah. Yeah. We can all put together courses and put them in Teachable and kind of break them down. The difference is, you know, what especially like what Ashley wants to do and what so many organizations hire me for is there is a lot more in terms of interactivity, in terms of how people are thinking about the content. So if you, yeah. if you have a, for instance, a method that you want to break down, well, there's different components to go into that method. Mm -hmm. There are statistics to go into that. There are actually strategies around the effectiveness of how to not only implement the content, but what are they going to walk away with? So you're, we're literally talking about instructionally building something from the front to the back that actually makes sense, but then also gets that client results versus the facilitation aspect of what we're doing right now. Or if you see someone on a masterclass, they are facilitating. That is, you know, they may have put together some slides and some notes, but there's very little interactivity typically other than a chat, a chat, um, you know, the chat stream. Mm -hmm. And also if, if you're on a really good one, they do a really good job of engaging people and continually asking questions. Yeah. Uh, but the instructional design piece just takes it like, I would say 10 times step further in terms of getting people to think introspectively and getting them to actually plan out what they're going to do as a result of attending your particular training. So it's a, it's a lot, I would say, you're looking at like the apple that falls off the apple tree. The instructional design is the apple tree. And the course that you create from an entrepreneur's perspective is one or several of the apples. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we talk through assessments and certifications and just having like a facilitation guide and like all of the the pieces to the professional puzzle. And for me, you know, one of the things that that I think a lot of speakers may struggle with is what what is the quality of what I'm pitching? Am I really able to give them a transformation? Because companies are looking to see like what they're looking to figure out. How do we evaluate the success of this? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're paying 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 thousand dollars to one consultant or consulting firm at that point, what are we getting out of it? And I think having a strong baseline is going to be really critical. Absolutely. Yeah. You're totally, you're like totally spot on. Yeah. I mean, they're, so that's, I mean, that's good. So we 55,000 average and that's just, that's, you know, that's where it's, it starts. That's average. There's more, there's some that are more, some that are less. Right. How have, cause you said that you don't, you don't cold pitch you always have kind of some level of introduction to the company. How have you been able, do you, have you put any systems around your referral base? So if, if you have an offboarding process that's like, okay, this was great. We're going to talk about your transformation. Do you know anyone else? Do you ask affirmatively for those referrals? Or what is the system around there? Yeah. So not only when we're offboarding, when we're onboarding, when I start the relationship, I'm always talking to them about the experiences that they've had and where, you know, like getting the information about where they've gotten their training from. Like, where do you get your professional development? So I start asking those questions early because I figure if this person who's hiring me, there has to be more people like this person in their network. So it's like, well, what do you like about the professional development that you receive? And then I always ask the question of them, too. What would you not like to see? Well, that then starts to help me determine what kind of also what to offer, but then also what other organizations to start going after that potentially look like them. And then as we go through the offboarding process, I start that early. So we we after the one month, about a month when we start kind of like winding stuff down, we start having our weekly check in so that I can do the handoff and I start there. So I, I start asking for the first thing I asked for was like, you know, was it great? Like, what did you like about this experience? I don't wait till the end. 
And then we start talking about that. And then the next meeting, it's a, a little bit more in depth. Then I'll start asking, is there anyone else that you know? I know that you said that you kind of are in these spaces. And I, and I happen to connect with this person on LinkedIn that was connected to them. So I just try to feel like, feel, find where I can make my connections and my inroads so they feel like I've gotten to know them over this time and they're more than just the dollar they hired me for. And then at the end, when I say, you know what, I think that like I see this person at this company and I think that this would be a great and Rose, would you mind either introducing me or at least just providing me with the information to connect? And usually I'd say probably 95 percent of the time they're saying, OK, the other five percent is usually like, well, let me talk to them first and then I'll kind of get back to you. And then the money is in the follow up, please. Yeah. The follow up. I had just got a contract last week from a lady that hit me in January, January. And then she went dark. Yeah. <laughs> and I just kept writing her. Hey, just wanted to check in, see how things are going. Six months later, we've now signed the contract. So just make yep. sure that when you're in that onboarding and offboarding period that you're putting those things in place so that you have the adequate follow up, but then that you can also follow through. Some people have waited. <clears throat> I had a client, a corporate client that saw me speak about a year and a half ago, and it took a year before we actually signed the contract. And now we've signed, we've helped them with two other engagements and they served as a referral base for another contract that is going to be very, very good. So, you know, it, you do have to, you have to wait it out. You have to wait it out. And sometimes people don't know what they want. And sometimes there are budgetary restraints and the speed at which you close in my experience has been based on the title of the person who reaches out and the urgency with which they need the work done. Yeah. So if it's the CEO reaching out or the president of the company, the close time is quicker. So we both own our own companies. When you told me everything about what you do today, I was like, great. Send me the invoice. Perfect. I'll pay it right. today. So that was it's just me. But if we were at the organizations that we came from, nothing gets done like that. No. It is always a 30 day. It's like in two weeks at the minimum. You know, that's short, yeah. but typically 30, 60 days. Yeah. Absolutely. My lead times, I would say on, on average, are 90 days to about six months. And it just depends on where you are in that process. And I always tell people, especially when I started like coaching people on the corporate pivot of taking their stuff to corporate. Mm -hmm. So the smaller the business, just like you just said, the higher the person you have to go. So yeah. like, like um, Ashley was just saying, she and I talked and we're able to work together because she can make those decisions because she's a small business. So you want to go higher so you can get an immediate response. The larger the company, if you're trying to work with Fortune 500 companies, a director level or VP will do. Um, yeah. And sometimes even a, a mid-level manager that has purchasing power, um, if they have power within their budget, then they can make that they can make that hiring decision. But that's also something that's like savvy in terms of your conversations with them that you need to find out. So I just want people to keep that in mind that the decision maker along the way is going to change based on the company that you're working with. And sometimes they are caps. So what yeah. I've experienced is, you know, if I pitch something, if I'm doing a one time virtual something for five thousand to seventy five hundred dollars, right. they may have authority to do that. And I think for some of the government agencies in Illinois, at least, I think their cap was like I think it was it, some of them. It was as low as ten thousand and some of them it was as high as fifty thousand before you had to go through the official vending process and the bid process where you have to bid on the contract and things of that nature. So have you done any of that, like uh, contract bidding? Gosh, yes. That's, that's a lot of the way that I'll go through the government contracting process. So you okay. go through in that the bidding process and some of them are what you would call sealed bids and some of them are open bids. And it's interesting, but they do have what you're talking about, especially in government, they have caps, but they did as a result of COVID raise them. And then they also took some of the restrictions oh, off, mm -hmm, of like the small cap. So you talked about 10 grand, they raised uh I don't know if it was overall, I think it was to $25,000 that they could actually institute contracts for that would not need, you know, any prior approval or additional um, review. So and that's, good. that's not nothing. That's good. Two. Yeah. 25 grand. I mean, just like, and they can give them to individuals that they already know. So like, if you are, you have that no like and trust factor and they need your services, they didn't have to go through their standard, like get three uh, processes in mm -hmm. to actually send or three bids. They could actually just come out and say, Ashley, we want you to do this work. Here's the contract. We can't go over $25,000. Now, how you begin to build them changes, right? So you can build them in a way that would allow you to get paid if it's a certain amount of money on a credit card. And I don't think most mm. people know about that. 
um, about being able to be billed to a credit card so that you can get paid faster, but the credit card threshold is also lower. So it's just thinking about creative ways for you to get to that dollar, but the money is there. Yeah, that's that's a really good thing to think about. I mean, and, and, and I love that we're talking specifics like this because it somewhat demystifies the process. And I'll tell you, I have not done government bids. I went through and did my certification and I think I was just so exhausted from just doing the certification that I was like, I need a break. I'm a bid in a couple months. I mean, it was just so long. It was such a long process. They had to come meet me in person. We filled out. They they know everything about me. Everything. Mm-hmm. They go through every single thing about you. So that was a lot. But it's good to know that you've done that and it's been helpful for your business and mm-hmm. you'd recommend it. Oh, certainly. It is a long process, like you said, Ashley, in terms of like the bidding process. And I will say that I've been on a lot of government, like a uh, large government contracts as a, you know, as the prime. And I haven't gotten a single one of them where I've been most successful is in those small caps of going out, meeting people, talking yep. to them. And then when the time arose, they were like, hey, can you do it? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, all right, well, you know, send me over everything. This is the way we have to do. We have to do all this other stuff. But then you get it that way. And I, you know, and and when I went to the vending fair and I actually did all my certifications, I met a lot of people and they were like, okay, well, let us know when you get your certification. But what I reckon, this is what I was told to do was to just send out a letter to the director of human resources for all the government agencies for which I wanted to work and let them know my contact information, a little bit about me, include my little brochure in there and then have them call you. And for me, I was fine with that. Like, I think that is that is fine. Like that we could do tomorrow, you know, not a big deal. And for this private corporations that I've contracted with and gotten deals with, if they're a privately held company, the fact of the matter is, in my experience, they're not tracking their diversity vending numbers anyways, as bad as it may sound. And they're not losing, they weren't going to not have me do the work because I didn't have my certifications. So, you know, they didn't care. And now some of them will track it, but they were, they never asked me about it. And it wasn't a part of my pitch. Right. So, you know, I think for those multi-million dollar, especially construction contracts, it is extraordinarily important to have all of your certifications, but get them because it doesn't hurt. And they're only a couple hundred dollars at the end of the day. But Mm -hmm. don't let that hold you back from doing what you need to do, which is the pitching. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you have any advice for new speakers? They're just getting started. They don't really know where to go. They don't have all of their materials together. What would you say to that person who's trying to figure it all out, but they want to get corporate contracts? Just start, like literally just start. And the one thing, and it, it sounds so cliche and people always say that, but yeah. uh, one of the things I absolutely live by is that the learning is in the doing and you won't yeah. know exactly where you are. You won't know about your confidence level because we all got swag when there's nothing on the line. Like everybody, <laughs> right. like you out here and you're on, you're showing up online. And I was sharing with Ashley before that I'm not visible online. I'm becoming more visible online because of, you know, what I want to do and what I'm passionate about and how I need to grow my business. But that wasn't my thing. It was my referrals were good. I was, I was good. So yeah, you got all this swag about this is what I do until it was time for me to show up. <laughs> so what yeah. I say to you is, is start where you start where you can and start where you're at. There are a lot of organizations that are looking for people to do things for free. So I still, to this day, keynote for the Girl Scouts. And I still, to this day, have designed a financial training workshop for girls who are in uh, ages six through eight for the Girl Scouts. And the reason why is because that's an opportunity for me to continue to sharpen my skills. It also provides me a chance to give back. And no, they don't pay me any money. But guess what I get a chance to do? Use the logo. (laughs) Hey guys, Ashley Kirkwood here, and I just want to take a moment to invite you out to the Speaker Rate of Cash Retreat. If you enjoy this podcast, then you will love the Speaker Rate of Cash 2020 Retreat in October, taking place right outside Chicago, Illinois. This retreat is for speakers looking to grow their speaking businesses, land corporate or college clients, and skyrocket their earning potential as a speaker. The in-depth sessions at this multi-day retreat will leave you understanding exactly the high-level client ac- client acquisition strategies that I use to land corporate clients. You'll also know the exact steps you need to be taking to grow your current business. Let's get to the nitty gritty. The sessions are amazing. We talk about selling your signature speech and we actually have time to go over the techniques of speaking. So if you want to become a better speaker as well as a higher paid speaker, then you should come out. 
we have another session called TEDx Secrets. Bring your laptops. We are actually going to be looking up and applying to TEDx Talks at the retreat. This session will be critical if you're someone who wants to land a TEDx Talk. Client secrets. You'll hear from actual clients about what they want from speakers just like you and selling success. We cannot do a retreat without talking about selling. But here's the session that I'm most excited about. We are going to do a vision organizational chart party. That means we are going to have not just vision boards, but vision org boards. We are going to map out how your speaking organization should be staffed, what you want that to look like, and how to use global outsourcing in a way that lets you fund the positions in your company that are currently open. So it's for you if you're ready to level up. If so, meet me in Chicago in October. Reserve your seat now. I'm only taking 30 speakers on this retreat. So go to ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash 2020 retreat. And the best part is you can get early bird pricing now of $550 or you can reserve your seat for just $75 down and make payments until the retreat. That's right. You can either pay in full and get early bird pricing of $550 for the entire two day experience or you can reserve your seat for just $75 down. Whatever you decide to do, make sure you're in the room. It's going to be impactful. And I'm ready to help you start speaking your way to cash in person in Chicago in October. Again, the website is ashleynicolekirkwood.com slash 2020 retreat. See you soon. Can't wait, guys. I spoke there. So I would talk about any schools that you can go to and do like, you know, high school keynotes or graduation keynotes or coming in doing workshop in your area of specialty. I would also say in this climate, just literally reaching out to local businesses to see how you might be able to support whether you do like customer service training. See if you could do a pro bono customer service training for an hour. Also libraries. Another piece is local government. And, you know, they're looking, they're overwhelmed. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Yeah. What do you have to offer? What can you go in and, you know, what, what, how can you set yourself up for maximum success in terms of starting to build those relationships? So I would just say start with the bar. It's in your backyard. And I don't know if you um, if you already did this, but the Girl Scouts board is gold. So the board of directors, I would be doing something, making sure that they introduce you to all of the board members you, or just reach out on your own. Right. Like, hey, I've done work for the board. I've done work for the Girl Scouts. I see that you're on the board. I'd love to chat for 15 minutes. This is what I provide. And for speakers who are getting started, another idea, everything that you said was phenomenal. In addition, I would look at the nonprofit boards that have folks on there whose companies you would like to pitch and offer to train that board of directors for a 45 minute training in your level of expertise, because they will then that's like 10 people who could bring you into their companies. And typically, if you look at the board that has a high buy in, it's a twenty five thousand dollar or a fifty thousand dollar buy in to be on the nonprofit board. That's the one you want to speak to, because I don't know if you all know this, but nonprofit boards typically a lot of them, a lot of the big ones have buy-ins and the buy-ins are sometimes, a lot of times, over $15,000. That means you pay over $15,000 just to be on the board. Guess who's not paying over $15,000 to be on the board? Broke people. Guess who's not paying over $15,000 to be on the board? People who, you know, like a lower level employee at the company. So the people that are able to pay that, and typically the company will match it a lot of times. They're in positions of power at the organization and they may be great for you to actually bring you in. Yeah. See, I didn't even I wouldn't even thought about that. So uh just wrote my note. Yes. Yeah. Uh, going in to the strategy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we have to we have to keep it real. Like it's nothing wrong with doing something. And when you even think about your nonprofit service, do the service, but I am not in a position wealth wise yet. <laughs> to give away stuff without figuring out how it strategically aligns with my goals. And I, and we can't feel bad about that. And so often as African, as black people, I think we are shamed if we're not serving the community 5 million times over when quite frankly, I don't even know a successful black person that does nothing for the community. I can't think of one. No. And, and I mean, to like, you got a college degree and you black, you helping somebody. Like, I just don't know of anyone who's not helping anyone. So don't let people shame you into doing stuff for people who can't do anything for you. If you're going to do something for free, it needs to have value for you, too, until we're filthy rich. Then we do what we do. It's not a big deal. Time is time is no big deal. Money's no big deal. We got everything. But until my family is set up, 
No, there has to be value both ways. Right. Absolutely. I mean, there, there for me, it's the value piece, but then it was also that I was already spending my time there. So it was like, what, you know, what opportunities do I have? And so you, when you, especially when you show up, they start looking for you, you stop yeah. having to ask for some of those opportunities and and then you can start having your ass to be bigger to them well if i'm going to do this for free can i get my photos you know if i'm going to do this for free can you give me a testimonial from the director if i'm going to do this for a complimentary yep. can you you know so the ask becomes different and so i think you know there's that way and then also the last thing i will say is look on eventbrite for some free uh events that are on there and contact their organizers they are always it's tough to put together an event and they're always looking for, um, you know, dynamic speakers, speak people who are just getting started or even just have a story to tell. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. And one thing that I heard you say is if you're going to do something for free or you're going to lower your rate, there has to be an adjustment. So you can't go in and say, hey, I charge five thousand dollars for this speaking engagement. And they're like, OK, all we have is two thousand dollars. And you're like, all right, that's cool. Like, no, it has to there. So are you going to speak for less time? Are you going to do it virtually so you don't incur travel expenses? Adjust. And it's good for you to adjust. And when you invoice them, put the full amount of your rate and then discount it so that they can't say that they in the future, when they come back, they're not getting that rate again. They know they're getting something special, something unique, something that is not necessarily something like because you don't want them telling they friend they refer you to. Well, I only paid her twenty five hundred. So right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't right. know what your invoice looking like at your company, but we only pay. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I want no confusion. <laughs> you don't want any confusion. Like, no, we, this was for you for the first time, and I was right. I was feeling good. There's less competition this month for my time. <laughs> right. This is that value based piece that we talked about earlier when we we're talking about money. So value base is not just around if you're exchanging dollars. It's it's also around the value that you're exchanging. So as you discount your rate, you need to you as a business owner, as a speaker, as an author, whatever you are, need to get more value if you discount your rate. So how do you equate that value yep. out? And that's what we're talking about now. Yep, definitely, definitely. Well, this is this is awesome. We talked about so many different things. Mm -hmm. This is great. So how do you help? We talked about how you help businesses. How do you help entrepreneurs and speakers, specifically those who want to get their trainings packaged in a way that they can confidently sell it to corporations? Absolutely. So right now I have been doing um, doing coaching. I'm in the process of, of creating a course called The Corporate Pivot. And this is designed for entrepreneurs, speakers and coaches to literally get into that space where you can own your brilliance and then position it for the corporate pivot because the language is different. How you talk to a customer on the, you know, on the, the, the business to consumer side, so different than how you have to talk to someone in a corporate. And it's, so it's learning that language, but also learning what services they are buying and buying on a consistent basis. But then also how do you package that up and put it together? So when Ashley and, you know, shares my information, you can definitely reach out to me. I'm doing one-on-one -on -one now until I build the course, which will probably be over the next month. And then I'll have the opportunity to engage that way. Definitely. That's going to be great. And I'm sure that I'll see you soon. And, you know, guys, we talked about a lot of stuff here when it comes to instructional design. I think that that's something that we have not talked about on the podcast before, but it's critical when you're thinking about developing long term relationships with corporate clients. So, I, you know, at the Speak Your Way to Cash Retreat in October, we're going to talk about your signature speech. We're going to talk about your signature program. When it comes to designing it, be honest with yourself. If you know you're not going to do all the things to make it exceptionally valuable for the client, then work with someone like Shana. Like, don't waste your time. It's too much to learn all this stuff. And as a CEOs, I think we need to focus on actually selling our services, <laughs> selling our services well. And I, you know, I know that working with you is going to be a great experience. And I'll update you guys as well on um, my program when it launches after we're done working together so you all can have firsthand experience about that. But this was awesome. So give us your Instagram handles. How can we reach you? How can we stay connected? Absolutely. So on Instagram, you can find me at Shana L. Campbell. And um, on I typically I'm on LinkedIn. So on LinkedIn, you can find me at Shana Dash Campbell. They, you know, they were hating on me. So <laughs> on Instagram, on LinkedIn, um, or if you find Ashley and you can't find me, if you find Ashley, she and I are connected, just connect with me on LinkedIn that way. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Perfect. Well, this was a great interview. Thank you guys so much for joining. And I'll see you next time on Speak Your Way to Cash. Thanks.
All right, wasn't that interview amazing? If you're anything like me, you have pages full of notes. But here's the thing. Before you head out, I want you to go to Facebook.com and join the Speak Your Way to Cash Facebook group. That is where I am. That's where a ton of other speakers are, a ton of other people who listen to the show. All We all congregate there and chat. And it's 100% free. Now, if you're ready to take your speaking career to the next level, I have two ways for you to do that. One, you can go to AshleyNicoleKirkwood.com slash SYWTC live replay and pick up the live replay. That training is seven modules, chock full of information. It's crazy. Go over there, read all about it. Or if you want a more personal experience, you're already, you already know that you want to be a speaker. You're ready to fully commit and you want someone to walk you through it and save you tons of time Googling and doing it on your own, then book a VIP day with me. You can go to AshleyNicoleKirkwood.com, scroll down until you see the VIP day section and get more information on that there. All right. Thank you guys again for watching. Please do not forget to leave us a review. That is how we keep this train rolling and get some of the best speakers in the world to get on this show. So please, please, please leave a review. Shoot me a message on Facebook or Instagram and Facebook in the Speaker Way to Cash group, Instagram at, at the Ashley Nicole Show. And I'd be more than happy to chat with you and say hi. All right, y'all have an awesome, awesome day. <laughs>